Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so as uh, Jim said, this is a takeoff. We presented on ransomware last year, and we are continuing. Uh, we have done a lot of work since then. We have a lot of data packed in this presentation. 20 minutes will not do justice, but we'll try our best to get through as much as possible. Uh, so let's get right to it. So the first thing I want to show is uh, a chart that shows the income attributed to ransomware. Right? And if you see, the last one year has seen a tremendous rise in terms of money paid to ransomware attacks. Now, this rise rivals, like, even companies don't have this kind of income uh, charts, right? Uh, so it's 400 times uh, since the previous year. Its impact is so profound that even uh, when you look at uh, RSA conference today, there is a one-day session or summit dedicated to ransomware that is happening in parallel to Cloud Security Alliance. So that's the profound impact that ransomware is having. Now, what we are going to talk about specifically is ransomware in the cloud. Uh, about six months ago, we created a threat research lab at Netscope and started looking at this problem of malware and ransomware in the cloud. And what you're seeing here is in the past six months, Almost every month, we have seen at least two to three different strains of ransomware that is associated with the cloud. Now, this does not include other strains of ransomware that does not have any cloud footprint. So as you can see, the, the impact is pretty profound, and we have to do something about this, and that's what we're going to talk about. So why cloud? Cloud is a new vector. If you look at typical enterprises, uh, you have very good coverage for email. Uh, you have very good coverage for like USB sticks at endpoints. Those are all well protected. But this cloud is a new thing that is taking over the enterprise, right? Now, th think about it. The cloud has a lot of touch points where there is a data handoff from an untrusted source to your organization. Let me give you some examples. Last year, we talked about uh, job advertisement sites, right? You advertise for a job, and people come and post resumes. So that's a handoff point where you are getting data from an untrusted source to your organization. Similarly, look at help desk or like customer support systems where customers can come and upload data. Rather than send it through email, they can upload it to these applications, right? So again, that's another example of a data handoff from an untrusted source and an outside source to your organization. So you got to go back and think as to what are these different points in your organization where a data can transfer from an untrusted source to your source. And you'll soon find that cloud is definitely a big part of that. So one of the data that we have been sharing over the years is our cloud report. We have been doing this for more than two years. And systematically, what we have found is on the left-hand side, what you see is measured data. We look at hundreds of billions of transactions every month. And across many, many organizations and come up with the average number of cloud applications that are being used in enterprises. And the chart that you see there is the average number of cloud applications, SaaS, IaaS, as well as PaaS, right? And the number is increasing. What it's telling is when we engage with enterprise customers, their estimate of this number is one-tenth of what you see. So typically, Enterprise IT admins know only of 10% of what the actual cloud usage is in a network, right? So that leads to the shadow IT phenomenon, right? On the right-hand side, what you see is the result of a survey. This is self-reported by IT admins as to the amount of data that is in the cloud, right? So about one-third of a, of a business's uh, critical data is in the cloud, and another third of that is even unknown to the IT. Now, again, this is self-reported, given the fact that Enterprise IT admins only estimate one-tenth of the cloud applications. You can imagine the amount of critical business data that is out there in the cloud. Now, coming to malware itself, specifically cloud malware, in the last six months, based on data that we have collected, what we find is um, we started tracking malware by itself. We found about 7% uh, we uh, tracked ransomware by itself. We found about 7% of malware in the cloud is attributed to ransomware, and it's growing. The other interesting things that you can see here is executable files are no longer the way in which 
uh, malware and ransomware comes into your enterprises, into your organizations. It's more around like Word documents, PDF documents with macros and JavaScript. That's the new trend or the, or the trend that is showing up again, resurgence of how these attacks enter your enterprises. So what we've heard, at least uh, according to Gartner, is about 20% of enterprises decrypt SSL. Why is this important? 100% of cloud applications go over SSL. So if only 20% of that is being inspected, this means that malware and ransomware can come undetected into your enterprise. Similarly, another data point that we have collected is for every upload that a user uploads to, uh, to a cloud application, there are three shares that happen from that one upload. So which means there's good scope for things traveling quickly in the cloud, right? So there are three shares that happen. Similarly, there's another beast that many people uh, overlook, which is the sync application. All these cloud applications, especially the cloud storage applications, have a sync client that runs on endpoints, right? Be it Mac or uh, Windows or even your uh, uh, smartphones. Now, what happens to the sync is when you put a file, when you download a file into your endpoint, it automatically gets synced to the cloud and from the cloud to anybody else whom you're sharing with. This is the topic that we spoke about last time, which we call the cloud uh, malware fan out effect. So the way it works is if for some reason your endpoint gets infected with, ma with ransomware and your files start getting encrypted on your endpoint, now any folder that is being shared with the outside, uh, any, any folder that is uh, synced to the cloud automatically gets encrypted as well. And from the cloud, it goes out to all the other shares that happen. Could be other devices of yours, yours, or it could be other users that you're sharing the document with, right? So this problem gets magnified many times because of the cloud. And that's why we feel it's very important to look at the cloud angle. So at this point, what we're going to do is we're going to transition and dive deep into a couple of these cloud-born malware, and Ravi is going to walk us through that. Thank you, Krishna. Uh, so what we'll do today is uh, we'll talk about two examples uh, of cloud ransomware, uh, and we'll do a deep dive into them. So the first one uh, is called the Verloc ransomware. Uh, Verloc ransomware is not new. It has been there for some time. Uh, what we are finding is a resurgence of Verloc variant, which is very unique. Uh, it's usually delivered via USB and external shares, but uh, how is it uh, related to cloud? So what we are finding is when people are getting or users are getting email delivered uh, with attachments, they have certain rules which are saving those attachments into the cloud storage to, you know, drives. And that's how it's getting into the cloud. And a lot of time, they also have rules which are set to share the files across other users. And that's how it's propagating. Um, Verloc ransomware, uh, like any other common ransomware, it encrypts files. And these are the file extensions that it encrypts. But at the end of the encryption, it changes the extension. It appends a .exe to the end of it. Um, this is the you know traditional or the common uh, uh, image that shows up once it finishes encrypting the ransomware, it's asking for ransom. A user can pay the ransom and then you know get their files back. So now, what is so you know unique about uh, Verloc? Uh, so Verloc is not just about uh, a file encrypting ransomware. What it does is it also creates a polymorphic file infector. So what I mean by that is, if you look at this slide, you have the original content which has been encrypted and we call this the clean code. And on top of it, it places a malware code and it encompasses all of this into an envelope of polymorphic code. So to keep it in simple terms, what happens is when this encrypted malware is shared with any other user and they click on it, they in turn get infected with ransomware. So it's similar to you know, how a worm propagates, except that it needs the right delivery vehicle. Uh, I'll give an example. You know, a lot of enterprises have users who share files. In this, uh, in this slide, you're looking on the left side, user A, and on the right side is user B. Uh, both of them are collaborating uh, on a folder called important. Uh, you know, once the user A gets infected with ransomware, specifically Verloc ransomware, 
all his files get become the polymorphic file infector. So apart from getting encrypted, they also become an exe. Now, because of the sync that Krishna had mentioned, you know, they get synced to the cloud and then they get synced to the user B's uh, folder. Now, user B also has the same, you know, polymorphic file infectors. Now, you know, if the user B, you know, typically in a, in a collaboration application, uh, you have this implicit trust between two users because you're receiving a file from another well-known user. So if user B goes, goes ahead and clicks on one of these files, what would happen is the ransomware would start, you know, exploiting user B's machine and all his files would get encrypted. So what you're looking at in this slide is a file user relationship graph in a typical enterprise. So the black dots represent the users and the blue dots represent the files. So you can see that a number of files are being shared between you know, various users. If there's one victim in, inside that red boundary and they get Verloc ransomware infected, then it can have a fan out effect and all the users within that particular boundary can get their files encrypted within seconds and minutes. So that is the impact of how the next evolution of ransomware is having on the cloud. So let's look at the second example. So we are also observing a blend of ransomware with other threats. So that's what I'm going to talk about here. So it's a locky ransomware along with a malware called Coater, which is a click fraud malware. So it's also usually delivered via email and also cloud service, cloud services like you know, cloud storage and collaboration applications. Typically, when the file arrives in an email, it's a compressed file. That means it's a zip file, and inside the zip file, you'll have a number of documents. Some of these documents <coughs> have dual extensions, something like dot doc, dot WSF. And when a victim clicks on one of these WSF files, it would go ahead and download JavaScript from internet. Now, this JavaScript by itself doesn't do anything because it depends on the first WSF file. And when both of them are combined together, they go ahead and download additional payload from the internet. And in this particular case, what we found is it was downloading two different payloads. One was the Locky ransomware. The other one was a Coater mal malware payload. And the Locky ransomware would go ahead, would encrypt the files, and would show that you know, classic message that the user can uh, pay ransom and get these files back. But at the same time, the Coater malware payload actually infects the victim's machine and installs you know, click fraud malware. So which means they are shown different advertisements you know, when they go visit the internet. So in this way, even if the victim pays ransom or does not pay ransom, the attacker is still making money. So this is a little bit deep dive into it. You can see two EXEs. The first one was the Locky EXE and the second one was uh, the Coater EXE. Uh, once Locky encrypts the files, it changes the extension. All of those are encrypted files and they have OS Iris file as the extension. Um, this is the traditional message that you see uh, to pay the ransom and get your files back. And in terms of Coater, what it does is it launches PowerShell using a legitimate program called MHSTA. And it adds itself to the Windows run key, and then it also executes JavaScript. Now the unique thing about this is the JavaScript is hidden inside registry key. And you can find that there are a lot of random you know, keys which are storing the malicious code. Basically what it is doing is it is becoming a fileless persistent malware where it can survive you know, across the reboots of the machine. So you basically cannot really restore your machine with good known or you know, uh, previous rest backed up uh, files. You have to trust that, or you have to make an assumption that the entire device has to wipe clean and go back and get your files. So these are two examples. Uh, we, there are a number of other examples that we are finding where there's a lot of evolution of ransomware and uh, you know, the, the bad guys, the attackers are taking advantage of, of the ransomware to use the cloud as a propagation vector and are using the benefits of the cloud to further their you know, demands. I'll hand it over to Krishna to talk about the best practices. So we just wanted to give you an idea of the types of ransomware that is uh, coming through the cloud. Uh, I hope it was pretty fast, but this information is available. But needless to say that 
it's very important to cover that vector. So how do you cover that vector? So <clears throat> we have some best practices, like four best practices. So first thing is you want to protect at rest and in root. So look at all your cloud applications, right? You have sanctioned cloud applications where you may be able to use OAuth uh, type of access to scan your data. Uh, similarly, you have a whole bunch of unsanctioned applications uh, where you need to have some, some form of enforcement in line so that you can detect these types of malware. Now, in order to detect these types of malware, it's not just anomaly detection, right? Some of this, as Ravi pointed out, uh, they hide behind the scenes. They look like a legitimate user using the system. So you want to have a pipeline of, uh, of stages of various types of detection mechanisms, like static scanning, dynamic sandboxing, anomaly detection, and so on. You want to invest in that. You want to make sure that uh, it covers not only browsers. Many security solutions depend on rewriting URLs. And they only work for browsers, right? So you want to make sure that you're covering all bases, because even one path that you uh, leave aside, these guys will find the way and infect your system, right? So again, browser, mobile, remote sync, these are all very important, because many security solutions that are available today look only for browser-based traffic. And finally, one, thing, the one good thing about the cloud is uh, it provides versioning, right? So Make sure that when you adopt cloud applications, you enable versioning. So even in the, if your files were to get encrypted, uh, you can always go and remediate that by going back to the previous version. And, and there are tools available uh, that can do that as well. So these are kind of the best practices. Again, uh, I would emphasize the fact that I made earlier. Go back and look at those touch points uh, in your organization where in the cloud, where there's a data handoff, from an untrusted source into your organization. That's very important. And that will open up the different possibilities as to what you can do with them in terms of protecting, uh, protecting that data coming into your organization. So again, I want to wrap this up by bringing back that uh, initial slide. Right? I want to emphasize again that this is a problem that is really getting out of hand. Uh, it's growing, as I said, 400 times. Now, I think we all can do some part uh, in addressing this. So I hope I, we have raised the awareness of this problem so that as you go through this week, look for solutions that are out there uh, in the uh, uh, exhibition floor, as well as when you go back home, uh, go back and look at these data points, uh, these, uh, not, uh, these um, touch points where you may have an exposure to this type of malware. Because if you go and act locally and spread the word in your network, uh, this is what we want to achieve. We can have a global impact where we can reverse this curse. Right? So with that, I, we have about two minutes. Uh, if there are questions, I can take some questions. Uh, or I, we are always available uh, on the side. Okay. So, Jim says, let's wrap it up. So again, all this information that was here uh, is available at blog.netscope.com. So uh, please feel free to uh, go and bookmark that. As we find new uh, ransomware and malware, we'll be providing this level of detail that we shared with you. Uh, once again, uh, thank you very much for your time. We'll be around. <laughs>